Hello and welcome, Navroz Mubarak. Um, my name is Devonis Corsone. I'm the education manager uh, here at the Aga Khan Museum. I'm very happy to welcome you here today as we have an enjoyable and from what I hear, wild exploration of springtime traditions reflected in Islamic art and culture. And before we begin, we acknowledge that this land on which the Aga Khan Museum sits has seen human, human celebration of nature expressed in rich and diverse cultures uh, for millennia. As a territory, we are here on the land of the Anishinaabe, the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the New Credit. And we're very happy to continue the celebration of culture here today, as we hear from Dr. Ulrika Alkamis. Ulrika is the Director of Collections and Public Programs here at the Aga Khan Museum. She has over 20 years of experience as a curator and senior advisor for museum and cultural projects, working with institutions including the National Museums of Scotland and Glasgow. More recently, she has served as co-director at the Sharjah Museum of Islamic Civilization, as well as senior strategic advisor to the Sharjah Museum's department in the United Arab Emirates. Please join me in welcoming our very own Dr. Ulrika Alkamis to the podium. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming for what I hope is going to be a cheerful and jolly journey of discovery through the colorful spring traditions reflected in Islamic art and culture. So we are very lucky today because our talk coincides with the official start of the spring season here in Canada and of course across the entire Northern Hemisphere. It is at this very point in the year, which is known as the vernal equinox, that the sun crosses the celestial equator moving northwards, and the axis of the earth is inclining its, or is increasing its tilt relative to the sun. So today, day and night are equal, but soon, and thank God for that, the days are getting longer, the dark nights are getting shorter, the trees are starting to sprout their first blossoms. The daffodils and the tulips will soon be defying the last remnants of the icy ground. The birds are returning. I saw two beautiful uh, black uh, blackbirds today. And there's the first rustling in the underground of our ravens and forests. So for all of us, and especially after this horrendously hard winter, these new signs of life really give us new energy and new hope. And we sense renewal, regrowth, rejuvenation, and rebirth. Now, let me get this, yes. Many diverse traditions and festivals mark the spring in Canada today, of course, and best known across the country, perhaps, are those associated with Christian Easter celebrations involving decorated Easter eggs, Easter bunnies, or rather hares, as well as profuse displays of daffodils and, of course, particularly tulips. Interestingly, it is these very symbols that are so familiar to us today that we claim them for our own without realizing that they have the most fascinating links to spring traditions that were celebrated over centuries, if not millennia, in lands we would now consider part of the Islamic world. And what is even more interesting, their association with spring is likely to have, at least in part, originated there. Let us take the rabbit, or rather, hare one of the animals frequently depicted in Islamic art. And I'm showing you here a few examples from uh, 11th century Egypt, a beautiful luster plate for, and a little bronze uh, sculpture, a little miniature painting from 14th century Syria, and um, a couple of hairs hidden away in a Mughal miniature painting of the 17th century. The rabbit was particular, po particularly popular in the arts of the southern Mediterranean and especially Egypt. Fascinatingly here, 
the use of the hair rabbit, uh, hair or mo a rabbit motif, can be traced back over some 5,000 years, clearly associated with fertility, rebirth, and regeneration. In fact, the hieroglyph you see on the top left, the hieroglyph for hair, shows a little rabbit over ripples of water. And this hieroglyph stood for to be, and the very essence of life itself. Hair figurines were placed in tombs as symbols of rebirth as early as the third and second millennia BCE in the hope that their regenerative powers might help the deceased to be reborn into the afterlife. Hair amulets, meanwhile, were worn in the belief that the animal's swiftness and keen senses offered effective protection against the forces of darkness. Beliefs like these survived in Greco-Roman Egypt and in the wake of the arrival of Christianity in the, in the first century CE, merged with this religion's newly introduced beliefs, becoming again associated with rebirth and eternal life, as well as the resurrection of Christ at Easter. And I'm just showing you as a little marker a Coptic textile that has a very similar little hair incorporated into its design at the bottom. So over many millennia, the association of the hair with fertility and rebirth and good luck persisted in the popular beliefs of Egypt. And today, the Easter bunny still forms an integral part of Egypt's spring festival, the Sham and Nassim. Today, this festival is considered a national rather than a religious holiday and is celebrated by Muslims and non-Muslims alike. It is a spring festival that again, in turn, goes back many, many centuries and today merges popular Islamic, Coptic Christian, and also ancient Egyptian spring traditions. To this day, traditionally celebrated around the Coptic Christian Easter Monday in April, public celebrations include outdoor picnics and the consumption of specific traditional foods, which I'm showing you here on the right, which are already documented in ancient Egypt. Fesikh, which is a fermented, salted, and dry gray mullet, as well as other types of fish, chas, which is lettuce, green onions, basal, termes, lupin seeds, and, lo and behold, colored eggs. All of these foodstuffs were already mentioned by the Greek historian Plutarch in the first century CE as items that the ancient Egyptians were known to offer as symbols of fertility to their deities during their very own spring festival around the vernal equinox known as Shemu, which stands for renewal of life, and considered to mark the renewed beginning of world creation. Fascinatingly, dyed, painted, and decorated eggs were also already among those offerings discovered in pharaonic temples and tombs as symbols of new life and regeneration. This was a custom that we can also observe all across the ancient Mediterranean and even into ancient Iraq. And these uh, ostrich eggs I'm showing you here give you some sense of what they would have looked like. Colored and ornamented eggs are also associated with another spring festival that is widely celebrated in the Islamic world and in Canada today, on this very day. Giovanna just said it, Nuruz Mubarak. Celebrated by Iranians, Kurds, Afghans, and many other peoples across West and Central Asia, Nuruz, which also denotes the beginning of the new year in those countries and cultures, predates the arrival of Islam by centuries, if not millennia. In Iran, it had long been associated with both Zoroastrian spring rituals and the investiture of Persian kingship. 
and it was profoundly ingrained in Iranian history, cultural memory, and traditions by the time the Muslims arrived on its borders in the seventh century. According to the Shahnameh, oh, that's some Iranian Easter eggs, forgive me. According to the Shahnameh, the epic Persian book of kings written in the early 11th century, it was the very first primordial mythical king of existence, Kayumas, whom you are seeing here in this wonderful 16th century miniature painting, which, on the, by the way, is on display in our permanent gallery at the moment. Kayumas took his throne for the very first time in existence with a divine sanction on the first day of spring. His fourth successor, shown here on the right, Jamshid, who is said to have ruled wisely over 300 years and is said to have overseen the first golden age in Iran's history by introducing his peoples to the sciences, medicine, the arts, and the crafts, was said to have inaugurated the royal feast of Nuruz. Ever since those mythical days, Persian rulers have made it a point to make their court the very heart of lavish Nowruz ceremonies, thereby symbolically linking their annual reaffirmation of universal God-invested power with the notions of renewal and rebirth associated with spring and the start of a new year. Despite repeated objections on the part of the Islamic establishment, royal Nowruz celebrations became ever more lavish as the centuries went by. We know, for example, that the Buyid ruler Adu de Daula, who is shown here enthroned in the 10th century, customarily welcomed Nuruz enthroned in a majestic hall in the company of his courtiers, enjoying special foodstuffs and fruit from gold and silver plates and surrounded by vases of colorful spring flowers. The court astronomer, having determined the start of the new year, would come forward and congratulate him before musicians and singers proceeded to entertain the court and perform melodies known as Noruzi, so specially composed for the occasion and already apparently inherited from the pre-Islamic period. From the 16th and 17th century onwards, we have even more detailed descriptions of the Nuruz festivities patronized by the court. And here I'm showing you a wonderfully animated um, painting from a 17th century uh, context in uh, Isfahan, in Chetel Sutun. So, in the royal palace, a special tablecloth, that we would call it, but rather floor cloth called sofra, was spread on the floor, and on it were placed large bowls of water, wine, and plates of various fruits, greenery, sweets, and colored eggs. And these were also given as royal guest, uh, gifts, with one char giving some 500 eggs encased in gold and painted with miniature paintings to his favorite women. The Shah took his place at the head of the Sofra and was joined by his dignitaries, courtiers, and his favorite women. Religious sermons and prayers were offered until the court astronomer announced the turn of the year. As soon as he gave the sign, the merrymaking began with court poets, dancers, musicians, and singers entertaining the audience. While the news was made public by palace guards, firing off their muskets, citadel guards their cannons, and an official band playing in the center of the town square. Over 13 days, congratulations and gifts were exchanged, audiences and delegations received, polo was played, wrestling took place, horse racing and hunting, so really a joyful season for everyone. By the 19th century, we also hear of public festivities held in front of the royal palace that I'm showing you here on this um, engraving. We know of rope dancers and trained monkeys, of bears and fighting rams, as well as court jesters and, again, wrestlers competing for the winner's trophy. 
Nauru's festivities were, of course, not restricted to the royal courts. And in fact, as one 19th century observer put it, Nauru's was a solemn feast throughout all of Persia, observed not only in the great cities, but celebrated with extraordinary rejoicings in every little town, village, and hamlet by Muslims and non-Muslims alike. And so it remains to this day, not only in Iran and the Islamic world, but also here in Canada. Nuru's celebrations have always incorporated many rituals and traditions, including bonfires, musical performances, picnics, exchanging gifts and sweets, visiting family, friends, and the dead. A main feature of the celebration is the so-called Haft Sin table, around which families gather in preparation of welcoming the turn of the year. Haftzin means the seven S's, and it refers to seven essential foodstuffs that start with the letter S, all of them together symbolizing the seven days of creation. There's sabze, a dish of lentil, wheat, or barley seeds that are made to sprout in advance and put on the haftzin table. There is serke, which is vinegar, and it represents age and the patience that comes with it. Sieb, apples, signifying good health and rebirth. Sir, garlic, which signifies healing and averting the evil eye. Samanu, a sweet brownish pudding that's made from wheat germ and symbolizes affluence and fecundity. We also have other items, sumak, which is a dry condiment, a red dry condiment made from a red berry, which symbolizes the colors of the sunrise, but is also associated with the blessing of rain. We have sipant, seeds of wild rue, sekka, a few newly minted coins, and senjit, dried fruit of the aleander tree that symbolize love and affection. If you look closely at this table in front of you, you will also see many other items that are added, and typically among those, yet again, are decorated hard-boiled eggs, which symbolize fertility. Often, a little aquarium or, or bowl with a goldfish swimming in it, which symbolizes life in life, life within life, and also a mirror that reflects God's creation, a book of the Persian poet's half, poet Hafiz's poetry, which to this very day is used for um, seeking guidance for the future, and a religious book, most typically, of course, the Quran for Muslims, but it may also be the Bible or um, the Avesta for Zoroastrian. There are also flowers, for example, the hyacinth, which is a very popular um, choice. And it's not only used because it symbolizes, of course, spring, but also for its mystical connotations. Its dark color, fragrance, and recurved petals symbolizing the perfumed dark tresses of the longed-for beloved, i.e. God. The poetic and mystical associations between flowers and spring is not restricted to the hyacinth. In fact, there is hardly a poet in the Islamic world who does not sing the praises of the season, with many seeing it as a heavenly sign that the world is yet again coming alive to worship God with renewed gratitude and wonder. The 13th century Persian mystic Jalaluddin Rumi, for example, makes many references to the mystical readings of spring and its flowers found in the gardens of his time. One of his particularly beautiful and quite astonishing garden poems sets the scene for his philosophy. Everyone has eaten and fallen asleep. The house is empty. We walk out to the garden to let the apple meet the peach, to carry messages between rose and jasmine. Spring is Christ, raising martyred plants from their shrouds. 
their mouths open in gratitude, wanting to be kissed. The glow of the rose and the tulip means a lamp is inside. A leaf trembles. I tremble in the wind beauty like silk from Turkestan. The censer fans into flame. This wind is the Holy Spirit. The trees are merry. Watch how husband and wife play subtle games with their hands. Cloudy pearls from Aden are thrown across the lovers, as is the marriage custom. The scent of Joseph, Joseph's shirt comes to Jacob. A red carnelian of Yemeni laughter is heard by Muhammad in Mecca. We talk about this and that. There's no rest except on these branching moments. To Rumi and other great mystical poets like him, the spring garden reads like a veritable book of nature. Every single flower is another messenger of God's love. Every single flower discloses the secret of the divine love that nourishes it, while at the same time, it stands in worship of the same, the divine mystery inherent with each and all of them. Rumi again. Again, the violet bows to the lily. Again, the rose is tearing off her gown. The green ones have come from the other world, tipsy like the breeze, up to some new foolishness. Again, near the top of the mountain, the anemone's sweet features appear. The hyacinth speaks formally to the jasmine, peace be with you, and peace to you, lad. Come, walk with me in this meadow. Again, there are Sufis everywhere, the bud is shy, but the wind removes her veil suddenly. My friend, the friend is here, like water in the stream, like a lotus on the water. The narcissus winks at the wisteria, whenever you say. And the clove to the willow, you are the one I hope for. The willow replies, consider these chambers of mine yours, welcome. The apple, orange, why the frown? So that those who mean harm will not see my beauty. The ring dove comes asking, where, where is the friend? With one note, the nightingale indicates the rose. Again, the season of spring has come and a spring source rises under everything a moon sliding from the shadows. Many things must be said, left unsaid because it's late. But whatever conversation we haven't had tonight, we'll have tomorrow. Among the most popular flowers associated with the mystical garden of spring are the narcissus, its bud likened to the open eye of the divine, and the tulip, metaphor of the sublime beauty and perfection of the divine, but also associated with the blood and under, undying passion of the lover who sacrifices himself to be with the beloved. Perhaps the most beautiful legend associated with this aspect again comes from the Shahnameh. It relates how the first ever tulip bloomed from the blood of two star-crossed lovers, the lowly stonecutter Farhad and Princess Shireen, in a tale reminiscent of Romeo and Juliet. Due to the intrigue of Shireen's father, Farhad, after struggling for years to attain his approval by meeting his inhumane directives, was made to believe that Shireen had died. In despair, he hacked at his own body with an ax, his blood dripping onto the barren earth. When news of his death reached Princess Shireen, she ran to her lover in the mountains and upon seeing him, took her own life. Where they lay together, their scarlet blood pooled and each drop formed a tulip, ensuring their love will live forever. How befitting 
given that the first tulips are said to have originated in the Pamirs and in the foothills and valleys of the Tian Shan Mountains, where China and Tibet meet Russia and Afghanistan. Today, they, are, they still grow wild in many of these areas, as well as in eastern Anatolia and the Iranian Plateau. Initially, these little wild tulips had, were much smaller and shorter and had very, very narrow petals, so much different from modern tulips, but they were blood red in color and very much venerated by the Turkic tribes that inhabited these areas who saw them as symbols of eternal life, regeneration, and eventually took them westwards into the Islamic world. It is unknown when the first civil, uh, the cultivation of tulips began, but we do know that by around 1050, under the rule of the Seljuk Turks, tulips were already very much loved and venerated in Iran and Iraq for their beauty and somewhat later also for their mystical associations, which were encouraged by their very name. In English, the word tulip derives from the Turkish tulband and the Persian dolband for turban. But in Persian and in Turkish, the name for the tulip is lale. And the letters of this word are identical to those used in the name for God, Allah. When in bloom, the tulip was seen as bowing its head in modesty and submission before God and therefore became, in a sense, the perfect Muslim. It was in the Ottoman Empire, which ruled large swathes of the Muslim and Eastern European world from Constantinople between 1453 and 1922, that the tulip with its spiritual associations was celebrated most persistently, pervading all aspects of cultural and artistic life. After Mehmed II had conquered Constantinople in 1453 and proceeded to build his grandiose palace, the Topkapi Serai, he also incorporated 12 luxury gardens that eventually required 920 gardeners to maintain, among other things, their prized tulips. And there were so many of them that they were also used to supply the city's flower bazaar. Under Suleiman the Magnificent, who ruled between 1520 and 1566, the so-called Istanbul tulip, which is so famous today and shown here across the artistic media on a beautiful mosque tile, a courtly kaftan and also in the form of a candlestick was first cultivated by the chief cleric of the empire, the Sheikh al-Islam Abu Saud Effendi. And he named his first variety nur i Aden, the light of paradise. Subsequently, the crossbreeding and the developing of new varieties of tulips became a widespread hobby among the royal and religious elite. And many new strains of the flower were highly coveted and extremely profitable because a, a true stock market for tulips um, emerged. So bulbs were valued <clears throat> for their mature flowers, color composition, for the petal shape, for their symmetry and the thickness and length of their stems and their leaves. And the ideal tulip at the time was very, very tall, narrow, almond-shaped, and ended in dagger-shaped, dagger needle-pointed uh, ends. <clears throat> and a motif like that you see across all the arts at the time. The first two-day tulip festival in spring was held in Istanbul under the light of the full moon in the early 1700s under Sultan Ahmed III. The invited guests, who included foreign diplomats, courtiers, and other members of the elite, gathered under the full moon in April 
and were asked to wear specific garments in colors that complemented the flowers among which they were invited to mingle. And the flowers were further set in scene by major uh, pavilion-like structures and bowers that the court confectioners had created out of edible spun sugar. And people were invited to nibble on the foliage while um, tort tortoises were walking around the garden with little candles on their back to illuminate the whole scene most effectively. By that time, we know there were around 2,000 individually named tulip varieties. And we are very fortunate that um, one particular tulip album survived from that time, the Lale Mejmoasi, the collection of tulips, which was prepared in Istanbul in 1725 with 50 individual illustrations by one Mehmed Bendegar, Mehmed, the servant of the ruler. And I'm showing you here three specific examples, El Mu'attar, here on the left. Mu'attar means scented because in those days the tulips still had very beautiful uh, scent. The pomegranate lance and the source of light. We are talking 1725. Only one year later, the price of these tulips reached absolutely astronomical heights. On June 28 in 1726, a bulb of the pomegranate lance in the middle was sold for what today would be $600. Two years later, the same tulip type fetched $2,400. And only second to this achievement was the appropriately named Sahib Kiran, <coughs> which means the, the owner breaker or bankrupt, which sold for $1,400. Eventually, the speculation around tulip bulbs became so catastrophic that Sultan Ahmed III had to make it punishable by death to trade tulips outside of the capital. So it became a very, very carefully guarded um, uh, trade. And the situation came to a head when the lavish tulip festivals that this sultan was also organizing really brought the government to the edge of bankruptcy. And eventually, um, in 1730, Ahmed III had to abdicate and subsequently the tulip mania of the Ottoman Empire came um, not perhaps to a complete halt but um, calmed down a little until it was enthusiastically reinstated in 2005 by the current Turkish government. In Europe, meanwhile, the first tulip bulbs were introduced by this gentleman, Augier Giselin de Busbeck, who was the ambassador of the Habsburg Emperor Fred, uh, Ferdinand I, who ruled from 1522 to 64. And he was the ambassador at the court of Suleiman the Magnificent in Constantinople. From um, Augier's home country of Austria, the tube th uh, tulip then made its way westwards where the cultivation in the Netherlands was developed through the efforts of Charles de Lécluse, who was the chair of botany at the University of Leiden. By the 17th century, Holland was the unrivaled center of tulip mania, with individual bulbs being sold for the price of Amsterdam mansions. And this uh, variety here on the right is one of those. And many merchants actually went bankrupt after a reckless and much inflated speculation. Meanwhile, ironically, by that time, the Netherlands also had started to supply bulbs um, to the Ottoman Empire. So it shows you how some phenomena really move between cultures very, very happily. Ever since then, it has actually been the Netherlands rather than Turkey or the Islamic world that has become famous and associated with the tulip. And it is, of course, from there 
that it made its way to Canada and now gives us our very own tulip festivals, not least to yet another vagary of history. During the Second World War, the Dutch princess Juliana and her two little daughters were evacuated from the Netherlands to Canada as their country was invaded by German troops. And the three of them were given refuge in Ottawa for the duration of the war. And it was here that in 1943, the princess's third daughter, Marguerite, was born at the city's civic hospital. And you can see that lady on the right in your beautiful purple outfit. In, after the war, the Dutch people and Princess Juliana in particular was so grateful that she decided to send Canada 100,000 tulip bulbs uh, as a gift and 25,000 after that, and eventually um, the annual contribution that has continued to this day settled on 10,000 bulbs for the capital. And unto, up to this day, um, we have two main areas in Ottawa where these are planted. One is at Ottawa's hospital where Marguerite was born, and then also in Commissioner's Park. And they are generally the two colors that Juliana loved best, pink and purple. And that is, of course, what her daughter is wearing here as well. And with this, we have returned to the start of our journey across the spring traditions and interconnections between cultures, which, of course, we are all about here at the Arahan Museum. I hope you enjoyed yourselves, and um, I would also like to encourage you, as you are here, to take in the Moon exhibition that we just uh, inaugurated a week ago and um, enjoy yourselves with us. Thank you very much, and happy spring. <laughs>